her pronouns, and I'm a third year student in the Baskin School of Engineering, majoring in computer science. I believe we're also going to be joined by Alex Wolf, Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering. And I would also like to thank our sponsor, the semiconductor manufacturer, SJ Hynix, for the generous support of Diverse Voices. SJ Hynix describes itself a global top tier company that contributes to humanity and society with its technology. Um, and before I introduce our special guest, I have a few technical notes. We are hoping to have plenty of time for questions and we want to encourage you to post questions in the Q&A uh, box below. Um, no question is too basic or too far out of left field. Whatever you're wondering about, someone else is probably wondering the same thing. Um, my colleague, Ira Shradankar, will be monitoring the questions. Thank you, Ira. Um, we will also be using the Zoom closed captioning feature, so you should be able to turn that on at the bottom of your screen. We will also be recording this event and posting it to the Baskin Engineering YouTube channel. And now our speaker today is Anika Narayanan. Anika is a project and product manager with the Amazon Alexa team where she drives design and engineering initiatives to create increasingly personalized, customized, and adaptive voice user interface experiences. She was promoted to that role after working as a conversational architect, gaining experience designing multi-turn AI and chat box interactions for both research and entertainment interactive experiences. In that work, she interfaced with machine learning, performance speech technologies, and persona development teams to bring AI characters to production state and create empathetic and inclusive user-focused experiences. Before joining Amazon, Anika interned at Disney as an AI character graduate research associate and was later hired full-time as a conversation design with the uh, designer with the Imagineering team. Anika holds a BA in English, literature, English Language and Literature and an MA in Editing and Publishing from the University of Southern California. She is a published poet and participated in the Santa Cruz-based music festival, Music in May, as a spoken word performer. At this time, I would like to turn over the mic to Anika Narayanan. Anika, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Sabrina, for that really nice introduction. Um, hi, um, my name is Nika Narayanan, and I'm a PM in the Alexa organization at Amazon, like Sabrina said. I'm based out of Seattle, Washington. So specifically, I work on the adaptive response team, where our mission is to drive increasingly personalized and adaptive experiences by leveraging customer and environmental information to create context and user-aware response handling. So what that means is that we use machine learning and explicit information gathering to help Alexa respond to a customer in personalized ways based on environmental factors and also customer variables like interests and affinities. So in my role, I manage cross-functional projects between teams of designers, engineers, and scientists to build and implement machine learning models to create a more adaptive and intuitive Alexa, and also to minimize risk and defect in voice user interface experiences. So today I wanna to talk to you guys about working in big tech as a recent grad and the particularities of spending the majority of my career the way most recent and forthcoming grads will, which is in a virtual workplace with what can feel like a compromised company culture and limited access to mentorship and collaboration. So, like Sabrina said, I studied English at the University of Southern California in a four plus one degree program. So at USC, I received funding to do senior research where I focused on parasocial affinity building or the relationships that readers build with stories and characters through content consumption. So while this research was really focused on literary content, I became increasingly interested in interactive media that wasn't parasocial and could be reciprocated on the content side, which led me to narrative design for virtual agents. Um, so during my fifth year after finishing my undergrad in 2019, I was a graduate research assistant at the Walt Disney Company working in R&D, which is research and development on virtual agent design. Um, so beginning my career in uh, R&D allowed me to focus on more investigative and blue sky design processes for virtual agents. So as someone who entered this discipline without the benefit of learned experience from a more technical education, R&D was a really valuable environment to be creative in the context of a very steep learning curve. And as a voice user interface designer, I designed virtual agent characters and built multi-turn and multi-party interactions. And my work was specifically focused on emotion modeling uh, or using customer inputs like tone, prosody, 
uh, which is the pitch of your voice or how loud you're talking, brevity and facial movement to recognize customer emotion and respond accordingly. And so my experience working in R&D at Disney also gave me an opportunity to contextualize how someone with a humanities degree um, could bring value to a team of engineers and scientists and how to build meaningful and empathetic experiences um, and how that is at the core of creating a successful virtual agent and also being a successful member of a multidisciplinary team. So I have a little story time about the easy peasy post-grad path that was not to be. Um, I was a master's candidate for the 2020 graduating year and received a full-time offer from Disney in January of 2020 to continue my design work with the R&D team as the first full-time in-house voice user interface or GUI designer. However, in April 2020, dun, 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 um, after making the decision to close down all of the Disney parks, resorts and experiences, um, the company was unable to retain the majority of those employed in that space. And I was furloughed from my first full-time job before I even officially began my first full-time job. Um, so yes, after being furloughed from Disney, you know, I experienced the grief that I think so many of us have felt in the past several years which is like this grief of premature endings without closure and burgeoning working relationships being cut short. And really like more than the work, I was really mourning the things that I'd wanted to learn but hadn't gotten to yet. And the people that I wanted to get to learn these things from. And so after a lengthy and stressful recruiting process, I joined the adaptive response personality team at Alexa uh, to continue to hone my interest in building emotionally intelligent virtual agents uh, with a focus on rapport building and emotion modeling. Uh, so in 2020, right, it felt increasingly relevant to work on projects that really honored the human need for interaction and rapport building in an isolated, you know, newly online world. And also for me to join a team that had a critical lens on the world around it. So I joined the team at Alexa, not only because of its alignment with the space I worked in at Disney, but also because of its commitment to raising the bar on being vocal and inclusive participants in cultural conversations. And so one thing I really wanna call out to you guys is that working in speech technology on a consumer facing household device in 2022, you're as much a public relations liaison as you are a designer or an engineer or a PM. And I was seeking a team that cared as much about form as it did function. So even though I work primarily in the back end space, a huge part of my job as a member of the Alexa personality team, both as a designer and now as a PM, is working with our legal counsel and our writing team to respond to sensitive and timely questions that customers are asking in mass. You know, Alexa, does Amazon believe that Black Lives Matter? Alexa, what is your stance on the Russia Ukraine war? So on principle, we only respond to these kinds of questions with precedent and entering the team at a time of tremendous precedent. It was critical to me that we remained conversational and empathetic rather than a default mouthpiece for the company as a whole. And that the team that I was joining, wherever that was going to be, valued what we were saying as much as how we were building and leveraging the technology to say it. So it can be really difficult, right, to reconcile uh, professional aspiration with personal values and to feel like one has to come at the expense of the other. And so while there are, of course, exceptions to this rule, I've found that sometimes the most powerful way in 2022 to be an ethical and socially aware professional is to work from within. So don't look for the team that's already doing everything right. Uh, particularly in the big tech space, you're not going to find that team. Um, instead, find the organization that's willing to continuously learn and grow and re-examine practices to continue to be better both uh, to, in terms of how the team operates and also what product we're creating. So in terms of working at Amazon, I kind of want to say this. Uh, once you've made the decision about where you want to work, um, I you know, it can feel like receiving an offer from a company that you've always wanted to work for really marks the end of the future, right? And so what does this mean? Uh, for me as a student, I was so consumed in visualizing how I would interview and how I would vet teams and roles against one another, you know, how I would draft LinkedIn messages. And then finally, 
uh, at the end of it all, how I would remain poised and professional when HR called to offer me the role um, above asking salary. Da, da, da. Um, so much so, you know, that receiving the job felt like the ultimate bar. And then inversely, losing a job so early in my career really felt like the ultimate failure. Um, so, however, what I found in practice is that the process of building your career doesn't really begin until you've started the work. And it truly doesn't begin until about six to eight months in when the adrenaline subsides and you step back and you think, oh my God, what am I doing here? Am I doing any of this right? Who let me be responsible for this? Um, so when I joined Amazon in June of 2020, I joined this cameras off workplace from a desk in my dad's house. And honestly, that desk was actually a plant stand with a bunch of books balanced on top of it for several weeks. So it was not exactly the glamorous start you envision when you join a company like Amazon. And people were very tired and raw, and we were not yet fluent in the practice of effective um, online meeting and collaboration. And you know, the benefit of this kind of environment is that you never forget anyone's name because everyone's name is listed in the meeting. Um, the drawback is that you would get a jump scare in the very, very rare event that anyone would turn their camera on um, because you got so used to attributing their name to a black box that you would forget that people had faces. So it was a really surreal time to join a workplace. Um, and so as a new hire in a faceless environment that was really initially boiled down to brief morning stand-up meetings and quick project check-ins, I felt extremely isolated and extremely dire directionless. Um, and several months in, I received this feedback from my manager that I wasn't being vocal enough and that I needed to become more comfortable with sharing and participating in team conversations. You know, and I struggled to tell her that the lack of faces and the inability to watch for facial cues made it really impossible for me to participate without succumbing to that back and forth, you go, no, you go, interruption cadence, right? And it was, it was so interesting because we were experiencing these communication limitations that really paralleled the tech the technology that we were working on, you know, lack of facial recognition and inability to fully assess tone and intent, you know device audio failure. So it was extremely humbling to fall so epically short in a personal way at things we prided ourselves in being best in class on at a professional plane. And so for someone like me, who strives in conversation and relationship building, I experienced a failure to connect uh, with colleagues to the same extent I had throughout school and at Disney. And this experience not only extended to horizontal collaboration with my peers, but also to my ability to seek vertical mentorship and leadership. Um, right, because the remote workplace, it removes the energetic hum of everyone working together in the same space towards the same initiatives and that humanization and personalization of seeing people's faces and being together in person. And what's left can feel like this vacuum of parallel play and oppositional communication styles, right? And people became increasingly sensitive and wary to scheduling meetings. You know, why talk on the phone when you can just slack? and also increasingly comfortable with heads down work without human touch points. You know, and so while there are many benefits to this adapted work environment that we find ourselves in today, um, and while we've really become agile in our ability to work remotely over time, for people with little to no experience with an in-person work environment, the ability to find your teachers and your allies and your path is obstructed. Right. So eight months into my time at Amazon, I was so burnt out on design and just feeling directionless and unable to visualize a path forward. It was difficult to seek guidance from the people who barely knew me as an employee, let alone as a person. Right. So while your technical skills will always be critical when it comes to your ability to grow in your career, I think there's nothing more important than how you foster your relationships with those around you. I found over the past several years that the farther we feel from our colleagues, the more we really do need them. And so my pivot in my burnout resolution was less focused on strengthening my technical skills, which is what I focused the first year of my career on at Disney. It was really more focused on strengthening my role within the organization culture, you know, putting faces to names and redefining what effective communication looked like and really making the environment that I worked for work for me. So to that end, I have a few thoughts on how to proceed at a crossroads like this that I want to share. So number one is this, look for helpers. 
So when it comes to advocating for yourself and your path forward in the workplace, I want to lead with a Mr. Rogers quote that I really like. So Mr. Rogers would say to his television neighbors, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You'll always find people who are helping, which I think is just really relevant, not only in the professional world, but you know, the world at large right now. And so asking for help can feel really, really burdensome particularly now when everything is virtual and everyone is carrying their own weight, you know, things like sending a message to an alum who works at a company you're interested in or asking a professor for extra time or guidance or asking your manager for feedback on how to improve. All of these acts can feel egregious. But what I've found more often than not is that people want to help people, but the only person who can facilitate that help is yourself. So I'll ask myself, if someone needed me in X capacity, would I help them? And if the answer is yes, and it's usually yes, but sometimes it's no, their answer will probably be yes too. And the worst case scenario is ghosting or someone saying no, which stings obviously, but it really isn't so bad. And you know, there will always will be someone who will help. And once you get down at the eye level of the worst case scenario and realize that even that isn't the end of the world, you can really start to release some of the inhibitions and start to justify being self-motivated. So when I realized at Amazon that I wanted to change job families and become a PM, I had zero experience being a PM. And so I needed the support of my senior PMs in the organization. Um, but it felt uncomfortable to ask outright for lawnmower leadership, which is what I like to call it when someone clears a path in front of you to ease you directly in. Um, and so instead, I asked for learning opportunities, the opportunity to shadow, to be a fly on the wall in meetings, to take small projects off of people's plates so I could learn while still contributing and not feeling like I was a roadblocker. So where it feels difficult to explicitly ask for help or favors, ask for hands-on learning opportunities instead. You know, my most successful experiences as a mentee have been built on a foundation of mutual service and benefit. So find people who will teach you and in turn find ways to contribute to them. Um, and then my next kind of thought here is to find and then when the time comes, be an empathetic leader. So previously, my concept of the professional world was that it was impassive and that the mark of success working in tech, particularly working in tech as a woman, is being an emotionless bulldog. You know, and I at times felt concerned that being an expressive and feeling person would be an obstacle in the tech industry and that I was too soft or silly or otherwise you know, too passionate to command respect or align with the company culture. However, as my job and my influence expands, I become increasingly aware of just how critical finding empathetic leadership and being an empathetic leader is. As a young woman in a predominantly male field, you are placed at inherent odds with your colleagues simply based on raw demographics, right? And people give in to impulses, you know, the impulse to ask the female on a project to perform administrative duties by default, uh, the impulse to use volume and intimidation to control conversations, the impulse to be reductive or devalue an employee based on their age or gender, right? Because, okay, a PM organizes and executes large-scale cross-functional projects. That's what a PM does. A male PM is considered to be a subject matter expert. A female PM can and often is reduced down to a party planner. Um, and I've received comparisons to male colleagues, wives, or daughters as a justification for out of bounds yelling, you know, and been willfully misidentified as an intern by stakeholders on projects that I've PM'd to successful completion, by the way. Um, and in exchange, I felt the impulse to go quiet and compliant and also to lose my empathy for my peers and my trust in my leaders as a defense mechanism, right? So I remember. Uh, being out on bereavement last September after losing my grandfather to COVID uh, fairly suddenly, right? And about this was about one week into my new role as a PM. And we were having a level setting meeting where I was supposed to be getting information about a project that I hadn't yet started work on. And it dissolved because the lead scientist had misheard my question, which then turned into a massive display of character-based criticism where I was being asked these questions like, are you old enough to be here? And are you smart enough to hear what I'm saying? Right. And that was a crisis point for me. And um, my path forward there was to decide, okay, this is who this person is, 
Now, Mika, you have to figure out who you are and who you want to be. And I knew I wanted to be a leader one day at this person's level. And I knew, okay, so this is a leadership example of what I don't want to be. And so I decided to make it my business to gain his respect, uh, not through yelling back, but through unwavering kindness and patience and standing my ground, but also, you know, refusing to stoop to the level of yelling and defamation, which to me is a really cheap and misguided attempt at problem solving in the workplace. Uh, and so through that, we ended up in time developing a strong working relationship of mutual respect, um, right? But it's hard. Uh, it's hard to do that because when you're the minority in any dimension, the impulse to take the path of least resistance is totally valid and standing up for yourself is easier said than done. However, there will always be leaders like you, so you have to find them. For me, finding strong lead female leadership and mentorship has been incredibly valuable for navigating adversity and being able to become confident in my work and my worth as a young female in tech, right? And so you have to find people who have been on your path and people whose path you can envision yourself on. Uh, my closest mentors at work are women 10 and 20 years ahead of me in the same career who can not only provide professional guidance, but who can also contextualize our work with shared personal experience. Uh, and, you know, I really, really reject that notion that you leave your feelings at home when you go to work, because that notion implies that you leave other people's feelings out, too. It's also a mental model, I think, that shames kindness and sympathy, but celebrates or at the very least excuses aggression and anger. And so I found that the most powerful tool for being an effective PM, mentee, and mentor alike is to always meet obstinance with compassion and to lead with kindness. So as the PM working between different teams with different disciplines and interests and goals to drive a common initiative, I have encountered aggression as a byproduct of knowledge gaps and conflicting priorities. And you know, the most effective way to get people to listen to you is not to get loud, but to get empathetic. And as people, you know, and as a mentor and mentee alike, people will want to help you and people will trust to ask for your opinion when you enter conversations with kindness and when that is what you're known for. Right, so there is room for professionalism and empathy at the same table. And a crucial part of professional growth is recognizing that the best leaders aren't the loudest, but the most conscious. And so those are the helpers that you should be looking for and the helpers that you should strive to be. Um, so my last thought on this is actually something that my grandfather used to say about watching sports, but I am a very lukewarm sports fan which is an exaggeration. Um, so I've reapplied this thought to work um, and it's that it's not over until it's over. So get comfortable with the idea of change. It's something that we've all had a crash course on in the past several years um, in one way or another. And so once I realized that getting a job was point A of my career and not the end point, I found myself much more receptive to the idea of diversifying my skill set and considering different avenues. I was initially really scared when I burnt out after 18 months of design because it felt like everything I had built toward had been invalidated and to pivot meant having to completely start over. However, you know, by becoming a PM at this juncture, I was able to have a unique and informed understanding of the buoy design process and, you know, the ways in which design operates with engineers and scientists and the best practices for imbuing the creative process into engineering requirements. So, you know, rather than erase my first year at Amazon, I'm able to leverage it and represent the best interests of the design community while also optimizing my communication skills and my interest working across teams to drive product. You know, there are so many perceived one-way door endpoints, you know, what you study in college, what your first job is, what industry you choose out of college. But, you know, your mobility really lies in your ability to find teachers and open your mind to learning and get comfortable with the notion of asking for help. And when you replace complacency with curiosity and flexibility, uh, you'll find that the path forward feels far more navigable. And so who you are will always come before what you can do, because the latter is iterative, but the former is what's really, really in the driver's seat. Um, and so I just want to end with saying this. About 40% of all Americans have been laid off at least once in their career. So that's just shy of half of all Americans who've experienced what we view to be the most epic hard stop you know, in our career journey. But the past several years have made all of us as seasoned employees and new hires and students alike, uniquely gritty and resourceful and empathetic and comfortable with the experience of being uncomfortable. 
right? And so at this point, it's really hard to imagine a pre-2020 academic or work environment and you know, all of the known quantities um, and simplicities that it afforded us. And so it's reductive and it's naive to spin the pandemic into a net positive. But a piece of advice that I give to new grads and to my friends and to myself is this. While it's hard to feel confident in, uh, well, it, well, it's hard to feel confident in the world that you're graduating into, excuse me, what you should feel confident in is yourself and your ability to grow in a temperamental climate. And so being a professional in 2020, it doesn't just mean being able to pass a skills test. It means being able to advocate for yourself, being able to both learn and lead with ethics and empathy, being able to remain agile and always pushing against the instinct to bear down and isolate yourself in a remote work environment. And instead challenging yourself to build a community and find mentors, right? Because people will always be there to help. So you have to find those people. And when the time comes and it will come, be that person for other people and it'll be great. And that's what I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening. Thank, thank you, Anika. That was a great presentation. I loved uh, talking, uh, hearing about your experience um, working. And I was just saying, if anybody has questions for Anika, please feel free to drop them in the Q&A chat box. Um, and I would be uh, passing them along to me so that I can ask um, Anika the questions. And while we wait for questions from the chat, I can ask some questions of my own, um, Anika. Uh, would you mind going over what a normal day looks like for you? Sure. Um, okay. So as a PM, uh, my job requires me to work across multiple teams um, to facilitate, you know, road mapping and burn down plans. And, you know, what we're really doing is developing these paths to success and checking in on milestone statuses and reporting on goal health internally into leadership. So really just facilitating the day-to-day -day functions of a year-long or two-year-long or three-year-long project. Um, and all of those projects will really integrate multiple teams and a lot of moving parts. So it's like being a cruise director. Um, and I'm attached to several large three-year projects that began this year. So my work is really focalized in terms of scope. So I'd say like 75% of my day is meetings. And within that 75%, Half of them are very structured, rehearsed presentations, kind of like this one, uh, with VP and director level leadership. And then half of them are more casual check-ins and level sets with Tiger teams and individual partners. And then I spend the time that I'm not meeting and talking about projects actually executing on these projects and you know, doing things like writing business requirement documents, uh, creating launch readiness plans, and just really driving other project documentation. Um, and also sitting in on other teams meetings and design reviews so I can get so I can make sure that I'm always fluent in what other teams and disciplines are working on to let that inform our projects. Great, thank you for that. Um, uh, next question is, I know you mentioned a little bit in your presentation about, you know, the difference between uh, a male uh, product manager versus a female product manager. And I was wondering um, how, like in meetings, how do you correct or stop someone who's interrupting you or, you know, disrupting your flow? Um, that's a really good question. And that's a really hard question. Um, I found, and this is always a learning curve, and this is something I'm still working on, um, and I think something I'll always have to work on. I found the best strategy to keep the temperature low, which is always my goal in meetings, is to keep it really low and calm. I let people tire themselves out. I let people finish their thoughts, and I'm just like, you keep running until you get tired and need to stop and put your hands on your knees and breathe, and then I'll jump in. I, on principle, will not... Uh, interrupt back. And sometimes, and my favorite line is, let's go ahead and take this offline um, and circle back. And I recommend you guys use that whenever you want somebody to stop uh, talking. <laughs> um, but yeah, let, let them tire themselves out. And, you know, people, people, people will really respond well to that. And people will feel more comfortable in an environment that doesn't just completely dissolve into tension. So be the bigger person, even when it's hard. And then offline, you can stew and be irritated. Uh, yeah, just let them, let them go. Great, thank you, that was great advice. Um, we actually have a question from the chat. Um, so uh, this question asks, do you have uh, advice for interns who are hoping to get a job offer? Yeah, I do. Well, first of all, 
very exciting. Um, I was that intern. I, I think that my best advice is what I talked about today, which is just really open yourself up to learning. I know that when you intern, particularly during the summer, it's like, oh, yes, a break from learning because uh, you've been learning all year. Uh, but people are really, really receptive to, you know, asking for mentorship, like via learning opportunities. And so ask to sit in on things ask for responsibility and ask to help and find those like niches where you can provide something that other people can't. And, you know, identify your own skills and really like hone in on them. For me at Disney, I found that there were certain projects where they really needed a writer's help. So even though they weren't projects for a writer um, and they weren't projects that I was assigned to, I said, can I jump in here and help? And that ended up allowing me to actually publish with some of the teams because they needed somebody to um, use editorial skills to fix their papers. So find, find those entry points and just be curious and be excited and smile and put your camera on and find your mentor and ask them because people, it's not some big secret that interns want jobs. It's not, you know, taboo to talk about that. Talk to your mentor and say, I would really like to work here. Tell me the steps, like, let me know how I can do this and they will help you. Um, and good luck. Uh, you know, do great. Thank you. Um, we have another question from the chat as well. Um, this question asks, how do you feel that your English and literature background have helped you? I love that question because as I know, like a lot of college students know the English major is sometimes um, reacted to with laughter. Um, and so I'm here to say that your English degree will take you anywhere you wanna go. Um, and for me personally, uh, working in tech, particularly at Amazon. Amazon is not a slideware company. We don't ever build slides. We're a doc company. We write documents and the first half of any meeting is spent reading a document. And so you really need to develop sharp writing skills and be able to communicate something effectively and you know prove a point with your words uh, on a page, not spoken. And so I've really found that being able to write has been a huge asset to me. Um, and in general, I think that your English degree also means that you're able to take a text and synthesize it with other information and have a really, you know, interesting critical read on it and being able to sort of critically understand text is going to help you no matter where you go. And um, it's just fun to, it's fun to prove people wrong. Uh, so yeah, the English degree will always help you. There, people always need an editor. Thank you. Amazing. Um, we also have another question from the chat. Um, this question asks, are you allowed to talk a little bit about what your Amazon interview process was like? Ah, sure. Um, okay. So, um, yes, the hiring process for any large company uh, including Amazon is typically really long and multifaceted, right? Cause they're looking for skills and behavioral requirements. So for my loop in particular, I was recruited and I received an invitation to apply after reaching out to a personal contact and receiving an internal rec, which helped because it floated my um, resume to the top of the pile. And that's not mandatory. You do not need an internal rec, but it can sometimes help. And so from there I did a phone screen, uh, which was then followed by several design skills tests. And then I had a portfolio presentation where I presented um, a bunch of work that I did at Disney with a lot of proprietary information redacted. Um, so it was a weird presentation. And then I had a day of interviews with seven different panelists, each for one hour. So a seven hour day where we talked about broader behavioral questions. You know, when was a time that you failed? When was a time you needed to you know, stand up to authority? And then I received my offer the next morning. And so what I can say about any big tech uh, interviewing loop is this, you know, the process can be really long and draining, but then once you gain the momentum, it actually can be really like thrilling and satisfying. And it really gives you a lot of good experience on how to package yourself and talk to new people even if the role doesn't end up being a match. Um, and can I give a tip? Actually, I'd love to give a tip about interviewing for uh, big companies. The internet is your friend and also your foe. Uh, most people, uh, insider tip, will post common interview questions for every big company. And there's a lot of informal reporting from candidates about company specific processes, which can be extremely valuable. And I really recommend if you're interviewing for a big company, um, use those resources. However, 
do not let yourself get too deep into the weeds on these reports because like a lot of Yelp reviews, everyone who takes the time to post usually has a pretty polarized experience to share that doesn't always represent the norm. So don't let those posts psych you out. Do your research, but stay in your lane. And that really helped me prepare, um, was just like reading about how other candidates did. It helps do your market research. Thank you, Annika. That was a great, um, that was a great tip. Um, we have another question. Um, this is a long one. So if you, uh, there are two parts, so I will ask the first one and then I can read the second part. Okay. So um, the question asks first, um, engineering operates very much as a metric I see and maybe especially so at a company like Amazon. How does your lack of formal technical background land with team members who have such a background? I'm going to ask you to repeat that question. I, I missed about three words in the middle there. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so this question asks, how does your lack of a formal technical background land with team members who have such a background? It's a good question. Um, you know, I think, I think it really isn't, you know, an us against them environment once you get into the workforce, I, particularly because I'm not an engineer. So I'm not um, I don't sit in an engineering role as someone with no engineering experience. I think that would be a very interesting social experiment. And I don't want to think about how that would uh, go down. However, I will say that everybody, when you're working towards a common goal, especially a product that's so you know clear cut like Alexa, everybody needs each other and everybody has these swim lanes that they can stay in. And so I've actually found that people really value somebody who isn't an engineer and who can, um, you know, as a technical program manager, I have a lot of uh, literacy and fluency talking to engineers and understanding engineering pro projects, which has taken a lot of learning and a lot of just sitting and listening and being taught by my coworkers, but also they really value you know, a diverse perspective and somebody who can look at something from a more creative lens, particularly in tech it, and for, you know, a product that's so customer facing, it needs that personality and it needs that softness that I think somebody with a humanities background can really bring. So people are very nice, um, at least to my face. Uh, who knows what they think behind the scenes, but it's, it's never been a problem. It's amazing to have linguists and scientists and people with CS backgrounds and, you know, people with all levels of uh, education coming together to work uh, it's a diverse team is a good team so that's that's, uh, that's great to hear um the second part of this question is is there advice you have for how engineering students who are of course highly technical can best interact with someone of your background in a multidisciplinary team i ask this question from the perspective of you as a supervisor but also for people at the same level yeah, that's a great question. And I love that question. That's such an important question to ask. I mean, I think that like what anybody who comes with sort of an area of expertise needs to know how to communicate at a level that everyone can understand and needs to know how to communicate really technical information in a palatable way. So the best advice I can give you is to learn how to be a good teacher because you're going to find yourself teaching. And I find that my relationships with the engineers that I work with are so fruitful when they're able to sit, like scale back and say, okay, let me teach this to you in a way that you might understand without the five years of educational experience that I have. And so like come, come at your work from the perspective of the teacher and think about how you would explain it. I will sometimes tell the engineers I work with and the scientists as well, pretend I'm 10 years old start there, explain it to me like I was 10. And um, that might seem a little bit reductive, but it really does help you get out of your head and think about the sales pitch of what you're doing. Um, and just be open-minded and be curious uh, and be sort of receptive to people's training and people's backgrounds. Um, and find there are always ways to communicate things in a way that everyone understands and be open to a dialogue. Because if you can, it, often if you can chat it out and be receptive to questions, um, you will get to that point of uh, mutual understanding. So, yeah. Thank you. That was great advice. Um, this is sort of like a continuation. Um, so this question asks, in college, you have a very structured plan of, say, classes that you have to take, the type of work you do in classes, et cetera. Can you talk about the shift going from academia to industry, where um, I'm assuming it's not structured in the same way, and what it was like to get, uh, like, getting used to the environment after graduation? Sure. Um, a good question. I um, My transition was kind of softened by the fact that I was doing this four plus one degree program. So my first year of industry, I was both working full time 
and also completing my master's degree. So it kind of sucked, honestly, it was a little bit too much. Um, but the difference really that I found was a, when the workday is over, the workday is over, no more homework, rock and roll. And that was amazing. Um, and you also just find kind of inversely that you suddenly have a lot less time than you do as a student and your day is a lot more structured and you don't, you have to kind of develop that stamina of being able to go from eight to six. Whereas, you know, I remember in college, particularly by the end, I had like one class on Thursdays for two hours. I was like, oh my God, I'm exhausted. And then suddenly you're, you know, hitting the ground running and talking and talking and working and working. So I really think like your physical stamina takes a hit. And, but also you kind of recapture your after work hours and there's suddenly like very clear boundaries of what's work and what's life, which I think is really important. Um, and it's important when you start industry to honor that and make sure that you're taking your time um, after work to do things besides work. Uh, it was exciting. It's, it's honestly, it's awesome. I miss college, but it was a really healthy move that felt you know a lot more natural and uh, stimulating. That's great to hear. Um, we have another question. Uh, so how do you correct someone who says something that isn't true in a meeting, um, especially if that person outranks you? Ooh, that's dramatic. Um, it's a good question. I'd say for me, particularly as a PM, go to every single meeting armed with data. Amazon is a data company, prides itself in being a data company. Even if you don't understand data, for me, Excel was really foreign until I graduated. Take the time to understand your data and not only be able to like report on numbers, but explain how they work because nobody can argue with data. And I found that a really kind of like healthy way to not go below the belt and sort of become accusatory or, you know, otherwise antagonistic with people in a meeting is to be accepting of perspective and listen and hear people out. Like I said earlier, you know, let people run their course and finish their sentence and then serve them with the receipts, right? That um, actually, the, according to my calculations, which you can say, um, X is true and not Y. And I just found that that's the most tactful way to keep feelings out of it. Nobody can argue with numbers and um, just keeps it nice and clean. Great, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about promotion uh, within the teams? Sure, so promotion at Amazon specifically. Um, yes, so what I can say about promotion at Amazon is that it's very rigid very, very lengthy, and it demands a lot of precedent. Um, so promotions at Amazon will occur every quarter. Uh, right now we're in Q2, just for reference. But to be ordered, uh, in order to be considered for a promotion, you need about a year of runway so that you can build a compelling document that demonstrates proof of capability. You need to be nominated by your skip level. So that's your boss's boss. And from there, you can start the process. And once you've developed this document, which is pretty much evidence that you are ready for the next level. So not that you've done well at your level, but that you've actually been performing at the level above you. You have two sets of panels. So a peer panel of people at your level and then a leadership panel, people a couple levels above you. And they'll review your document and decide based on the criteria that are set out for each level, you know, whether or not you qualify for the promotion. And so just for sort of reference on timing, I'm getting a promotion fingers crossed, at the end of the summer in Q3. And I started the formal process after my nomination for this particular jump in October of last year. So it takes a lot of time and um, you just have to be patient and work hard. That's great advice, thank you. Um, next question, this is specific to Amazon as well, I believe, uh, what is the hiring process like? Sure, so, I think I discussed this a little bit earlier, but you know, it, it's this extremely long um, process that has multiple rounds. It will often start with a phone screen where HR will call you and ask you some very basic questions just about who you are and what your experience is to see if you're a good match. From there, if they deem you to be a good match, they'll move you over to the hiring manager who often will be the person that you report to if you end up taking the position. You'll have some conversations with the hiring manager. If they like you. Then, it's a it kind of, then from there, it kind of splits out based on what, um, what your uh, path is and like, you know, what kind of job you're seeking. For me, as a, I can speak to the designing uh, hiring process, 
I had a couple of skills tests where they gave me some sort of homework assignments, honestly. And I had to go and create some designs, uh, some user flows, and then present them to a small team. If you do well there, you move on to a portfolio review, which not every uh, discipline has. Engineers don't have that. Um, engineers will just go from their skills test to their um, to their behavioral round. And once your portfolio review is done, you go to that big mega day where you have seven different people, some of whom will work on the team that they're hiring for, and then some who are bar raisers or people outside of the organization just to level set so that there isn't any conflict of interest. And you'll have an hour long session with each of them where they ask you those you know, kind of more behavioral questions. And then from there, you're done. And then you wait and like stare at your email and refresh it like every five seconds for like two or three days. Um, and that's a long day. And it's very cool. In a pre-COVID world, they actually flew people up for the day to Seattle. So I was really, really bummed that I missed out on that because they like buy you dinner and stuff. Uh, but I just sat in a room for seven hours at my dad's house for that last thing. And during one of my um, during one of my cycles, I actually kicked my desk over and knocked everything over and I still got the job. So it's high pressure, but there's room for being a human, I promise. It's really stressful. <laughs> yeah, it sounds really stressful. But yeah. Super, um, yeah, but I mean, super rewarding and congratulations, you did get the job. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, the next question, this is sort of like um, a continuation. Do you know what they are looking for when hiring a new employee? Yeah, um, I do actually, because I just started um, being on hiring committees uh, for the first time in the past couple of months, which has been really exciting. Um, and so what we're looking for right now, is, at least at Amazon, and I think that this extends to other large companies as well, we're looking for green employees. So new employees, young employees. And that means people early in their career with a lot of drive and excitement uh, to compensate for what might only be a couple years of experience or maybe even a couple years of interning and no practical post-grad experience. I think this is because, honestly, a lot of companies are facing attrition right now um, and struggling to retain more senior employees. There's a lot of uh, horizontal movement at the senior level. And so what we've found is that a really successful model is investing in our younger talent and growing from within. So I will say it is a very exciting time to be a new or upcoming grad. And companies really are looking for talent that they can foster and people who want to come and excited about the work and ready to learn and people who, you know, they could see having for a couple of years. We just extended offers to two um, employees, both of whom are finishing up their senior years at university, which is really exciting. And those were roles that previously we probably would have been hiring somebody with five plus uh, years of experience, but we've sort of changed our model to really open up for uh, young blood. Yeah. That's really good to, you know, as yeah. someone who's also creating yeah. like in like the future, that's like really good. Um, oh. thank you. Thank you for the input. Um, that makes me feel a lot better. Yes, yes, um, so I'm worry. sure it does for the, yeah, I'm sure, um, the rest of the people who are in the seminar also feels like, like a load off, you know? Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, next question. Um, do you have any advice uh, for students who on how to choose a job? Yeah, ah, that's a hard one. Um, I'd say market research and also just learned experience. So, you know, talk to people, reach out to fellow alums or people who have the job you want or who work at a company that you're interested in working at. You know, you can find these people on LinkedIn. You can find these people through the Alumni Association, even older classmates um, who are ahead of you in school, find those people and ask them. Um, but then also, I think my like second piece of advice there is that the job choosing process never stops. You know, I had changed jobs several times and, you know, within my time at Amazon. And so, you know, use your internships and your first job and your second job uh, to not only pay attention to yourself, but those around you and think, hey, would I like to do that? You know, would I be good at that? And, you know, just allow yourself to like continue to learn and continue to grow. Um, and just remember that that choosing process doesn't ever stop. And so always be aware, even after you get that first job that, you know, maybe that's not, maybe that's not the forever thing. And you want to do what the person next to you is doing, which is what I ended up doing. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah. We have a question from the Q and A. Uh, they ask, um, can we please connect with you on LinkedIn? Yes, you can. I'm also going to provide my email um, because we're just going to get really candid for a second. 
I'm struggling to access my LinkedIn right now. Um, oh, here's a, here's a tip, an out of pocket tip. Um, re- remove your university email from your LinkedIn before you lose access to your university email. Otherwise, you will have to argue with LinkedIn customer service. So yes, you may. Um, but I'm also going to provide my email because in the event that you're not hearing from me, I want to make sure that I can answer your questions. Um, and LinkedIn fix forthcoming. Great, thank you. Um, we have another question from the Q&A. Uh, for a UX design role, would you say a portfolio is necessary for early career roles or is having a slide deck of projects slash case studies okay? It's a really good question. Um, and it's hard, right? Because when you're new in your career and they're asking for a portfolio and you're like, what? Like, are you kidding me? I think a slide deck is fine. I think it depends role over role and company over company what they're looking for. and once you're in that, you know, interviewing process, it's a little bit easier because you can ask your HR representative for more specifics and kind of get an inside scoop. I think a slide deck is great. I think the most, like, however you can most professionally and comprehensively package the information that you've done or the information about the work you've done, rather, excuse me, um, that's good enough. And companies know that not everybody has the same amount of experience. And if you're pulling stuff from school, if you're pulling, you know, research that you've done, it's absolutely fine. Just show them what you've got because they're looking for somebody who has, like, the capability to do new things. They're not hiring you for work you've already done. Um, so I think that that's fine. And another really good tip that I could give you is, you know, find somebody, find a mentor or find um, somebody who has the role that you're looking for, you know, either at that company or another company and ask them to review your portfolio and be like, Hey, can you take a look at this? And can you give me feedback? Like, what would you think if I was interviewing for a job at your company and I presented this portfolio? But just don't let perfection sort of be the enemy of progress. And don't like wait, wait, wait until you have the perfect portfolio because your portfolio is always going to change. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, One last question. I know you were talking about how when you started working, your work day ended like pretty precisely and you could have really good balance. But now that you're not in the master's program anymore, how do you still make sure that your work life uh, balance is still, you know, healthy? That's a good question. You mean, how do I party? Um, It's a really good question. (laughs) Um, I think, okay, well, here, here's what I'll say. It's really hard to reconcile, you know, being driven and having a fast paced time consuming career with an active social life. You know, it can be draining and there can be FOMO, fear of missing out um, on both sides of the equation. But also I think it's important, you know, I really think it's important to remember that we all lost something really significant and that should be honored. You know, for for me, uh, when we entered the pandemic, I was 22 living in LA with this amazing circle of friends. And now, you know, I'm going to be 25 in a couple of weeks uh, living in Seattle with another wonderful, you know, albeit newer circle of friends. And like, while a lot of incredible and happy times have occurred in that period, there was also a tremendous loss that, you know, we've all experienced. So I justify having fun and setting hard stops to invest in my personal life by remembering, you know, A, you just can't take it with you. Like this is life. And that work will all like B, work will always be there when you get back in the morning. And at work, I think people really trust you and respect you more. You set a precedent for yourself and for others of getting the job done and then still leaving room for life, you know, and you know, this is, okay, this is kind of morbid, but I also really like to remind myself and sometimes my workaholic family members that at the very end of all of this, it is so much less about what you did and really more about who you were and who you were with. And so, you know, you're not your job and your goodness and your righteousness and your success as a person is not your job. And you are so much more than that. And I really hope that the pandemic has kind of given us all a new perspective on how to balance because it's just not work is just never going to be the most important thing. So I try to keep that in mind. Uh, when I scoot on out of work at five o'clock on the dot to my personal life. Yeah, that's great to hear. I think yeah. I have to remind myself more of that. When yes, everyone. Too, not, but not just yeah. Work, um, too. yeah, it's mm-hmm, important. Yeah. That's really great advice. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have for today. Um, thank you so much, Annika. Um, again, thank you so much for uh, presenting for us. And thank you, everybody who came to listen to the seminar. Um, I hope you guys all have a nice day.
Yeah, thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. And again, um, I'll have the correct person distribute my email address so you can get in touch sooner, but please connect on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions about, you know, voice user interface designer working at Amazon, I'm here, I'm an open book, I'm here to help. Uh, and I look forward to hearing from you guys and I hope everyone has a great, great evening.